barely see just little, look like little powder puffs. Waddling right beside, they were on both sides and right behind their mother's tail. And they were, they were just, as ducks do, waddling across and got on a cross. And as soon as that happened, uh, the, the old lady and the girl stopped off onto the side to make sure everything got okay. And the car started moving again. And everybody's cheering and honking their horns and waving at them. Thank you, thank you. I did the same thing. I said, thank you when I drove by, and they're all waving their hands because I want to tell you there's times you have got to get out of your comfort zone. You see a need that people around you don't see, but somebody has to take action. Somebody's got to get out of their comfort zone to do what needs to be done. You know, as I looked at this text, I was thinking back of our message a few weeks ago, how God gives us the Great Commission. We were coming up on the missions conference, and we were talking about that we're going to be partners in the harvest. And when our missionaries come in and the missionaries are here to uh, be a blessing to us, and we are here to be a blessing to them, and, but we're partners in the harvest. And to be partners, it means you have to be a participant. You've got to be a participator to be partners. And so God has called all of us to be partners together. And so God gave us the Great Commission, just a little review. We were in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 where Jesus said, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the ends of the earth you see even when he sends us to the ends of the earth what does Jesus say lo I am there I am with you I am with you always I got a text message yesterday from a friend who told me about another precious friend of mine who I've known for so many years and her husband we've been praying together for cancer and his cancer and all and and she had, they had received some really, really bad news the other day. And uh, so uh, out of the comfort zone, people come. And, 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 you know, all I could say when I texted them last night, I just say, my heart is right there with you. I, I am there in spirit. I'm right alongside of you. If I could just reach over and take your hand, I would take your hand. Just to, to know that that I am moved by things that touch their lives. And you know, guys, that's the way it is with brothers and sisters in Christ. Every one of you here today who knows and loves the Lord, we have a, we have a bond that is unbreakable. The, the Lord says to his kids, nothing, nothing in all this world shall ever separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. When you're going through times of great shock, great loss, great grief, great sorrow of soul and spirit, you just don't even feel like getting out of bed. You don't feel like getting up. You feel like life is... But God has left us here because we are partners in the harvest. And the old song says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all when we see him. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow shall erase. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I see five big strapping boys over here on the front row youth and here at Bethel. And I think they're probably some of the strongest and best looking and greatest guys in all the earth. But I want to tell you, you know, it's possible that you can be strong and you can be athletes and you can be, you can be champions. And yet there are things, some things that you're so afraid of, you don't want anybody to know you're so afraid. Oh, that I would have to say something. I would have to get up in front of somebody. I would have to, I would have, God would tell me to do something that's way out of my comfort zone. I just don't know if I can do it. 
I think of people who've got degrees and who have got college education and they've had years of training, but there are things that absolutely would draw people like you out of your comfort zone. And yet if we're going to be partners in the harvest with our missionaries who, are, who have given up everything to go into other parts of the world to speak languages they've never heard before, much less never learned because they've never been translated so often. I was talking the other day on uh, text, uh, emailing back and forth with Dana and Nathan uh, Rains, or Nathaniel and uh, Dana Rains, who are in Mexico working with a tribe translating in that dialect with Wycliffe, same group you guys are with, translating the, the Word of God. But I want to tell you, God gave us the Great Commission. He shows us that a great harvest is awaiting. And we read about it in Matthew 9, 35. Jesus said, lift up your eyes unto the harvest fields, for they are white, ready to harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, part of the work of missions is praying and praying for the, the young people and older people who God is calling to, to leave what you have known, to, to leave where you've always lived, to, to put behind all the careers. I was telling somebody the other day, I said there's some great lessons when I read through the Bible. I was reading in the book of Jonah, and I wrote down that day, whatever you do, whatever you do in life, don't run from God like Jonah did. I was reading in the book of Genesis, and I was reading how Lot and Abraham were dividing up the land. And I, I remember after reading that text again, I said, here's another recommendation I would have for people. Whatever you do in life, don't do like Lot did and pitch your tent toward Sodom. You know, I think that there are decisions that we have to make. It's like I tell people, Every day I'm telling somebody this. I would just suggest one thing in your life, that whatever you do, don't sit in God's chair. You ever gone into a house and, and, and you start to sit there and say, oh, oh, no, don't sit there. Sit, come, come sit over here. That's, that's Dad's chair. I will tell you, don't ever let yourself sit in God's chair the director's chair of your life. You get in the back seat and turn God, turn, turn the steering wheel over to God. Say, God, would you get behind my steering wheel and would you drive and direct my life? So here, here we are. God gave us a great commission. Jesus calls those who will follow him to be fishers of men. Number three, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. John 16, verse 13 and 14. The Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God comes, He will guide you into all truth. Let the Holy Spirit be your guide because He will guide you. And don't think that the Holy Spirit can't communicate with you. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the God who created you and me is perfectly well able to understand you when you talk to him and you are able to understand him when he's... You've got to be listening for it. That's why Jesus again said to the seven churches in Revelation, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to his church. Seven times to seven different churches... And if Jesus was here today, Jesus would say the same thing. If he's standing right here beside me today in the bodily form, Jesus would say, listen, you want to listen to what God wants you to do? He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church today. Then I want you to know the Lord is faithful to open the hearts of people to hear, to understand, and to receive the gospel. In Acts 16, where we left off, Paul and Silas go, try to go into Asia, and the Bible said the Spirit forbade them to go into Asia. Then they tried to go into Messenia, 
And the Bible says the door was closed into Messenia. That night they prayed, and the Bible says God gave Paul, uh, Saul, a vision that night, and he saw in a vision a man from Macedonia saying, Come over and help us. Come over and help us. And so they went straightway. The very next verse in Acts 16 said, And straightway we left for Macedonia. They were that willing and that ready to go. They were just waiting on the leadership of God. And when they got there, they went down the very next day down by the riverside, and that's where Lydia believed and her children and her household all got saved and got baptized that day a few verses later Paul and Silas thrown in the Philippian uh, jail that night the jailer prayed to accept Christ he took them to Paul and Silas to his home his wife got saved all of his children got saved and then God moved them on to the next step you see the Lord is faithful God doesn't tell us to save anybody. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. God is the only one who can save anybody. But we have to, we, he uses our voice. He uses our lips. He uses our lives. He uses our obedience. Because that's exactly what happened in this story in Luke chapter 5. The Bible says that God saves all who come to him by faith. I love telling people. I remember we were baptizing here one day at Bethel out in the river out here, and we were baptizing some people. And I'll never forget this young lady that was one of several we were baptizing that day. And b before she stepped down into the water, she said, Pastor Charlie, I just need to ask you one thing. She said, now I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my life. And, and she said, I, I really meant it and, and all like that, but I just want to ask you, uh, she said, I've never said this to you, Pastor Charlie, but she said, I've done some really, really bad things in my life. And I said, I said, when you prayed and asked Jesus to save you, I said, all the sins you have ever committed, they're all forgiven, all forgiven. She said, but Charlie, Pastor Charlie, I've done something really. She said, I've had 13 abortions. And she said, can God ever forgive me? I said, God can forgive you if you truly mean it with all your heart and you ask. See, when the Bible says that God saves all who come to him in faith, you know what faith is? Watch my fingers there. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. When you and I say, I have come to the end of myself, I have messed up royally across my life. I have failed. I have sinned against God, and I've sinned against man, and I'm so sorry. Somebody texted me late last night. Brother Charlie, how do I forgive myself? And I got back, I just got back on. I mean, people are bearing burdens that they're carrying unnecessarily because we have got to learn to forgive others. Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, I will not forgive you when you ask me to forgive you. But if you will forgive others, God says, then I will forgive you. And so we've got to learn how to accept the forgiveness of our sins and so God saves all who call on him. There is a, an emptiness in the soul of mankind, a void that cannot be filled, an empty feeling in people's spirits, like a puzzle that has, it's all put together, but it has one piece missing and cannot be found. I have heard many people who have stated this, I have searched for the meaning of my life for the purpose that God put me here for, a plan for me to follow, and all that I have ever hoped would satisfy me has failed. My life was totally empty until I found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. Now, this is a compilation, of course, many many people through the years 
that have made these almost identical statements to me because it's amazing when God is working in hearts and lives. It's so very, uh, it can be very unique in itself, but all so many things are so common, and these things are common in all the lives. So we are partners in the harvest. I want to ask you, how does that work? How does that work when, I, when, when the Lord says that we're partners in the harvest? He wants us to go into the harvest fields. Well, it means, like I said a few minutes ago, it means that we've got to be, if we're going to be in partners in the harvest, we have to be a participant. We have to be involved. So I want to ask you today, as partners in the harvest, how is being a partner in the Lord's harvest How's that thing working in your life? How's it working out for you? If you and I were having a conversation on this subject today, and I just said, like, we're just in the house. We're just sitting there at the coffee table. We're just looking across the chair at each other. And I say, hey, tell me, how, how's, the, how, how's it going sharing your faith with others? How's it going being a fisher of men? follower of Jesus how's that working for you well here here's what I'm finding out I think a lot of people are like the guys that were in the ship or had been in the ship all night long fishing look there in Luke chapter 5 again in uh, in verse 5 Luke 5 5 Simon Simon answering said unto him master we have toiled all the night and have caught nothing we have fished all night long and we've caught nothing how many times have you gone gone on a fishing trip and caught nothing it's happened to me a few times in my life <laughs> and uh you know i haven't really even thought about it all that much i, I love to go fishing i love to go out on the lake and all but we, 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 we're going fishing. Let's catch fish. And let's enjoy why we're there. And I feel like that a lot of churches today would say, we have toiled for years, and we have caught nothing. Well, there's two questions, guys, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this Wednesday night. The two diagnostic questions that if you've ever gone through EE, Dr. D. James Kennedy, the great Presbyterian pastor down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for so many years, wrote the Evangelism Explosion Plan. Uh, I just think it's the greatest thing ever, ever been penned by human beings there. But Dr. Kennedy was a great man. He was a great pastor. He was a great spiritual leader. And the Lord knows, I, I wish that we had Baptist churches and, and Presbyterian churches today with the kind of commitment that I saw in the life of D. James Kennedy. But Kent, Dr. Kennedy said there are two questions that in, involved in evangelism explosion. And I want to just give those to you tonight, or today, and we're going to talk about them Wednesday night. But the first question is, if I'm talking, if I'm talking to you, Lynn, and I just say, Lynn, uh, you and I are just talking here today, but would you mind if I ask you just a couple of questions? Oh, I know Lynn, he would not mind. And uh, he said, well, what are they? And I, I would say, Lynn, have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for sure that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? And so the first question is, I'm asking Lynn, as I'm, I'm, I'm really asking everyone in here, have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you drop dead right now that you'd be in the presence of the Lord in heaven and no matter what they say what their answer is to the first question it's an icebreaker into question number two the second question is this Lynn I, I don't mean to paint a bad picture but let's suppose you did die today and you had to stand before God tonight. And God, you're face to face at the throne of God. And God says to you, Lynn, why should I let you into my heaven? Why should I let you into heaven? Lynn, what do you think you might say 
to God. So when I ask that second question, that is where you're going to find out what people are trusting in that they are going to heaven. And here's, here's what the answers normally are. Among church members, lifelong church members would say, oh, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a Catholic. And you know, they are telling you what they're putting their trust in to get them into heaven. They have become a member of a church that they think gives them the right to go to heaven. And so we're going to talk about the answer to the two diagnostic questions because there's only one right answer. It doesn't have anything to do with being a Baptist. It doesn't have anything to do with being at this church. But it has everything to do with all of the compiled teachings of the Word of God on the completed, finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection. And our faith, do we believe that Jesus is God's Son who was crucified for my sins, that He died on the cross, He was buried, He rose again the third day, He ascended into heaven, He's preparing a home for us, and one day He's coming back and He's going to take us to be in heaven with Him for forever. It's a simple act of faith. So I wanted to say, close off with this today. I want to ask you today that in order that you and I might be participants and partakers and partners in the great mission field of this earth, number one, go where you have never gone before. Go where you've never gone before. Number two, do what you have never done or even tried to do before. And uh, what, what would that be? Well, when, when, uh, when the Simon Peter was talking to Jesus, he said, we fished all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, what you just told us to do, we'll do it. We fished all night and caught nothing. All night long we fished and caught nothing. Nevertheless, because you are telling me, I will do it. Do what you have never done or even tried before in your life, and that is to tell somebody else how Jesus Christ saved you and changed your life and what he means in your life. Number three, <laughs> begin to see people around you that you have never seen up close, really before if you're just looking at globs of people which are, we live in a world of globs of people sometimes it's hard to come face to face with you with you that's why Jesus lists the groups of people he said I was hungry and you fed me I was thirsty and you gave me a drink I was naked and you clothed me I was a stranger and you took me in I was sick, and you came to see me in the hospital. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the disciples stood back. They said, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? We don't remember that. When, did we, when were you thirsty, and we gave you a drink? And when were you naked, and we... We don't understand, Jesus said, inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Some people go all through life looking for the perfect, perfect example of the person that if I could just pick out somebody that I'd like to see get saved, it would be, let me see, let me see, it'd be her. I will tell you, God doesn't work that way. When you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God's going to bring people into your life. You start listening to him and looking at him. I won't tell you there are going to be those daily divine appointments, and I don't care how big and how tough these guys are or how smart these people over here are or how beautiful these people out here are. I don't care what denomination they are and plugged in. I don't care. All those things, can I just tell you this? When you obey Jesus, he's the one sitting in the driver's seat, and he's calling the shots, and we are saying, nevertheless, Lord, 
because you've told us this is what you want to do. We're going to obey. And you know it was obedience, ladies and gentlemen, that filled up not one ship, but they had to call for help, filled up two ships with fish. Not because they were great fishermen, not because of the water they were even fishing in. It's because they obeyed the master of the seas. And they, he, they followed his direction. Ask what you maybe have never asked anyone else before. Jacob, has there ever been a time in your life where you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior? It, it's, a, it's asking a question that maybe you have never worded it and said it, even though you love these people with all your heart. You just are nervous. You're, 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 you're scared a little bit. You, you don't want to mess anything up. You, you think maybe the timing's not right. Maybe this is not the right thing. We got all kinds of excuses and reasons. Nevertheless, but Lord, because you said it, I'm going to do it. And I want to tell you, guys, a lot of people... That, that have, have known me have said things like this. Well, it's easy for you. Look what you've done. Look where you've been. Look what you Ah, I won't tell you what. I, there's no credit that can be taken when you're walking in obedience to God. You don't have, you don't have anything to do with it. It's, it's not any of us. It is all of him. And we can't cause things to happen. But we need to, like I always tell people, people don't care how much you know until, first of all, they know how much you care. If people see you're talking to them and you truly care where they spend eternity, they don't mind you hurting their feelings. They don't mind, the, they don't mind you shedding tears. They're going to shed tears. But it's going to pull you and me out of our everyday comfort zones just like the old lady and the young lady got out of the cars running across in busy congested traffic stopping cars directing traffic standing back walking by the side of that little mother duck just waddling across the road somebody had to get out of their comfort zone and I want to tell you, every time somebody gets saved, it's because somebody didn't leave it up to anybody or think that everybody would do it when nobody does it when anybody could have done it. If they would just say, yes, Lord. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you for the missions conference with our theme partners in the harvest thank you for the leadership of our world missions team god thank you for the awesome support that people came and prayed and gave and 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 shared of their life and their time god that's that's such an important thing anymore people's time god thank you for those and lord i i thank you that today we look into the challenge that we have for bethel church because god our our role changes uh, as we go along this church has been here 180 years and 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 we can't do things uh, always the exact same way sometimes we got to get out of our comfort zone we got to talk to people we don't usually talk to go to places we don't normally go say things we don't normally say we've got to be willing to get out of our comfort zone and w be willing God if it costs me being embarrassed or humiliated or, or making a mistake that I'll correct the next time. God, help us not to let fear hold us back. Never May we be like those disciples that day that said to Jesus, we've toiled all night and not caught anything. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will go into the deep and we will let our nets down. God, Take us. Take us from where we are. Take us, Lord, to where you want us to be. Take us, Lord, into our comfort, uh, out of our comfort zones and into the zones around us. They're so close. The other zones are so close sometimes. It's just talking to new people. It's just facing up to our own fears. And when 
uh, the psalmist wrote, Lord, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Lord, I pray that little prayer to you so many times. You know I do, but I, 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 want, er I want all of us to be able to say, what time I, wh whenever I'm afraid, I'm just going to trust you, Lord. But I'm going to, nevertheless, it's your word. I'm going to go out into the deep, and I'm going to let my nets down today. God bless us as partners in the harvest in the coming year. Would you just take over completely our world missions program, our world missions vision? The way, the way that we have done it in the past is probably not going to be the way you lead us. Lord, however you lead us, wherever you take us, God, help us to be willing to say, nevertheless, at thy word, I will go out into the deep and I'll let my nets down. And God, may it abound with an overflow of fish being caught in the nets. It may, it, may it become, Lord, a great crowd of witnesses who come to Christ because we just simply obeyed your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Let's stand together as we sing our invitation this morning I want to ask you today if if God's speaking to your heart would you pray today just uh, our invitation today is this would you would you pray today that God is going to take you this week out of your comfort zone give you somebody some opportunity you've got to be praying for it you've got to be looking for it you've got to be expecting it You've got to be trusting God to do it. But I want to tell you this. If you pray that prayer and you really mean it, I guarantee you, God's going to give you what I always call, you know this is what I call them, divine appointments. They're divine appointments. Some of you are here today because you're a divine appointment. This, is, this, this was a divine time just between you and God, not between me and you, but between you and God. If you want to come to the altar and pray, you have a commitment or a decision God wants you to make today, can I just say to him, don't be afraid. Put your trust in him. What he's telling you to do right now, do it. You'll never be sorry. You come while we sing. <laughs> Well, the Lord bless you. I hope you have a great week this week. This Wednesday night, we will be back on our regular uh, Wednesday night schedule with our supper at 515 till about 10 after 6. It's a complimentary supper and a great time of fellowship. And then we're going to pick up where we left off this morning in the Word of God. And I'm just praying for God to bless you and keep you this week. And uh, Gloria, we're praying for you guys in the service tomorrow, I think 3 o'clock. Is that correct? Right here? Okay. Got you all in our prayers. And uh, we've got a lot of people on our prayer list. We rejoice what God's been doing. DJ, you and Janie were out, what, about four or five weeks, I think, with COVID there. And it's just like we're so glad to have you all back and see some others that are back with us today. But uh, I hope God blesses you in a great way. And Dennis and Marcella and family, just so good to get to have you here. And uh, thank you again for the blessing you were. Let's just close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together today. I pray that your peace would be upon this place. And Lord, would you be the Prince of Peace in the heart and life of every one of us today. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. 
Amen. God bless you.